Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Emergence Church, and we are glad that you are tuning in to join or check out one of our worship services. Uh, this is a service from our Thursday night service, and our hope is that it's an encouragement to your faith. We also hope if you're not plugged into a local church that that would be a priority. Church is a, a huge gift from God to us, and while we can have things to resource our discipleship like online services, they're never a replacement for actually joining and committing to a local church. If you are in New Jersey, we'd love to have you come check us out one Thursday night or one Sunday morning at any of our services in any of our locations, and you can find that online. And now um, it is uh, a hope that you would be blessed by the service. emergence are you ready to worship if that's you please stand and join us we're going to give praise and adoration to the only one worthy
such a joy always to just raise a shout of praise to our God who's worthy of it. Amen. Amen. That's what we're doing here. We're here to worship Jesus. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we worship Jesus in three or four different ways, right? We worship through singing songs to and about Jesus. Uh, we worship by studying through God's word. We believe it's his divine revelation to us. And we uh, worship through our generosity. We worship by uh, giving our time and serving on teams here and in community groups. And then also uh, we uh, worship in generosity by giving. And if you, if you don't call emergence your church home, we'd ask you not to give. We're just glad you're here to worship Jesus. Jesus with us. We hope you have a great time doing so. Um, if for those of you who do call Emergency Church home, um, you know, uh, you can get, we don't pass a plate or anything. We uh, have boxes in the back you can give there, or we, uh, most of us give online. Um, and your giving there really matters. Thank you for that, for being faithful in that way, because uh, we have an opportunity to partner with local uh, ministries that are doing good work. We have an opportunity to partner with church plants and uh, missionaries that are sent out from this church, and then also just for um, church plants locally and around the world. Um, and so, I'll, I'll, and then obviously also just to see the gospel 
uh, go forward from here in this location and up at Ringwood as well. And so um, it is our joy to uh, be worshiping together this evening. Um, in that joy, uh, would you just turn and say hello to someone around you, greet them, let them know you're happy that they're here, and then you guys could have a seat. And I'm Andrew. And here's everything you need to know about what's happening at Emergence. Yeah, we are just over a month away from Easter week. It's hard to believe, but it's coming. And so are some awesome opportunities to extend an invite to your friends, coworkers, neighbors, and family members to hear the great news of Jesus. Now, some invitations are a little more memorable than others, and our hope is to equip you well to invite well. We're just a couple of weekends away from an epidemic of muggings happening all over New Jersey. That's right, for those of you who are new around here, mugging our neighbors is an easy and loving way to invite someone out to Easter. You get a mug, you get a card with all the details for Easter, and you can add some goodies in there too to sweeten it up a bit. The hope of all of this is to see those we love hear and respond to the gospel, and Easter is a time where many are open. Let's invite well. And there are plenty of opportunities to invite, with eight services in two locations, including our first Saturday Easter service option. Easter weekend will be full of celebration and full of gospel opportunity. All of the details of times and locations are on the digital bulletin, and cards with details will be coming soon with those mugs. So be praying, planning, and inviting. That's right, and speaking of prayer, this past Tuesday, we started our morning prayer times in Ringwood and Totowa. We're meeting on Tuesdays leading up to Easter from 7 to 7.30 in the morning at both campuses to pray for this season and the opportunity for people to come and know Jesus. Join us on Tuesday, either in person or wherever you are. We're also inviting the entire church to fast on Tuesdays while devoting time to prayer. It's a good chance to reflect, rewire our hearts, and turn our minds outward to those in need of Christ. And this season of prayer really culminates on Good Friday where we'll hold a special time of prayer and communion in both Ringwood and Totowa. Our guided prayer and communion gathering will be held at 4 and 5.30 p.m. on Friday, March 29th. For families, keep in mind that E-Town will be open for the 4 p.m. prayer time only, so plan accordingly. If you're new to Emergence, welcome! You've come at a great time as we look ahead to Easter. We also want to extend a special invitation to you to join us at Discover Emergence. It happens every first Sunday of the month, which is next Sunday. That's right, it's the place to go to learn about the church. Explore ways to plug in, and if you're not yet a member, it's the first step in our membership process as well. We'd love to see you there next Sunday. It starts at 1020 in Totowa and 1030 in Ringwood. You can sign up to let us know you're coming out on the digital bulletin. For more information on that or anything else going on in the church, check out this week's news on the digital bulletin. You can use a QR code in the chair in front of you to get there. That's right, that's all we've got this week. Let's keep on loving Jesus, loving people, and plowing a counterculture.
All right. Um, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you guys, starting a brand new book of the Bible tonight, and uh, really excited for that. And just if you're dropping in, we're going to jump into it. It's actually a great time to jump in and, and uh, get your head around what's going on, because we're going to look at the, the Gospel of John, which is an incredible, incredible book in the New Testament. And just so if, if you're brand new and the Bible's super new for you, I just want to give you a quick one-minute overview of the Bible, okay? The Bible is one book made up of 66 smaller books. Uh, It's amazing in that it's written by multiple authors across multiple continents over multiple centuries. And what's fascinating about that is just think about the probability of this. Those multiple authors across multiple continents over multiple centuries write a book that comes together and tells one central story. And the central story is the arc of are falling into sin as humanity away from God, his promise to send a Messiah, and ultimately it's the arc of God's redemptive love through his son Jesus that we can be reconciled to God, our sins can be forgiven, and then we can walk with God in the great hope of the world is found in the person of Jesus. Now what's amazing about the Gospel of John is as you look at those 66 books, the Bible's broken up into an Old Testament and a New Testament. So the Gospel of John is the fourth book in the New Testament. So to understand it, The Old Testament deals with God creating the world, him making mankind, him giving him purpose, and then ultimately mankind falling into sin. In the first book of the Bible, God makes a promise. And he says, I'm going to send a savior who's going to crush the work of sin, crush the work of Satan, crush the work of death. And so from that moment, Genesis 3, you start waiting, how is God going to provide this savior? The rest of the entire Old Testament is God bringing that promise to fulfillment. It's kind of like you you get a telescope in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible, and you look into it and you see God one day is going to provide a savior. And you're like, how is he going to do it? And throughout the Old Testament, it it comes increasingly in focus, increasingly in focus, all these details about the tribe that the Messiah will come from, the line, the fact that he'll be king, the fact that he'll be a reigning Messiah and also a suffering servant, all these incredible details we get. The Old Testament ends And then we open to the New Testament and we find God's Messiah has come in the person of Jesus. And the whole Old Testament is about Jesus, both his life, his ministry, and also the response of Jesus through the early early church, through the the, the work of the gospel in the the, uh, near world right after Christ ascends to heaven and ultimately in Revelation, the hope of his return. So that's, that's the Bible. Now, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everyone calls them Gospels. They're they're the account of Jesus' life. And so all four of them follow Jesus' life. They they fall from different vantage points. John was one of Jesus' disciples. He was very close. We're getting a real eyewitness uh, account of the life of Jesus and a real close friend of Jesus. Um, Jesus had a a, a really great relationship with John. It's beautiful. We're going to see that over the next several months as we study this book together. Um, John is incredible in that he follows Jesus' ministry, he follows Jesus' teaching, the selection of the disciples, and ultimately, like every other gospel cow, it climaxes with Jesus' death and arrest and placing in a tomb and resurrection and ultimately a commissioning out. And so this is an incredible opportunity for some of you guys because you're really new to faith or you're returning to faith. And I just, I always say, It takes a lot of courage to walk into a church. Like, I really do admire that. And it's amazing to me how many people, they make up their minds about Jesus without ever opening the Bible, which to me is a bit crazy, okay? Like, I want you to make a decision about Jesus, but what I want you to do is I want you to make that decision by actually seeing who Jesus was and what he taught and what God's word said. And, and I do believe, like John so often says in, in this gospel account, that for many, when they see who Jesus actually is, that's incredibly compelling. And so I just want to say, if if this is new to you and you're dropping in and you're exploring, I really do commend that because most people, the craziest thing to me in the world, they make up their minds about Jesus without ever looking at what the Bible teaches about Jesus. And we're going to spend the next eight months 
teaching about Jesus. We're so committed to this, we painted the wall, okay? You saw it coming in. That's going to be there for eight months because we're excited to teach through just the the life and, and the ministry of Jesus. John's an incredible gospel account, one of the most famous things that a scholar's ever said about John. He said, you know, the gospel of John is in some ways simple enough that like an infant could wade in and be okay. Like it's like, it's simple and straightforward enough that in some ways it's like a kiddie pool. And yet at the same time, if you dive into John, this same scholar said an elephant couldn't plumb the depths of, of the Gospel of John because it, it's just fascinating in that it's, it's strikingly clear. John actually tells us the purpose of why he wrote it, which I love because it makes my job a lot easier. He goes, we don't have to guess. He goes, I've written these things so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. I love that John actually says that. He goes, here's the point. Here's why I wrote it. I want you to know who Jesus is and I want you to have life in his name. That's the whole point. That's the main thing. Now where John starts is a little different because John starts with a prologue and in this prologue he sets up this whole book and as he does that he's going to do something really unique. He's going to tease out a bunch of truths that throughout these next eight months he's really going to unpack. So in some ways, this is an incredibly frustrating sermon for me because it's kind of like John puts out all these bites of like an incredible meal. And he's like, okay, you ever go to like a tapas restaurant? Like we're, you know, we're Americans. We don't eat tapas. You know, we we order like 65 tapas and we're not full. We, you know, we, we like large portions, okay? I'm not advocating for that. I'm just talking about reality. And one of the hard things about tonight is John's setting up the entrees, but he's giving us these little tapas that he's going to unpack throughout the next eight months. And all we get to do tonight is just munch on these different tapas. And so it's frustrating for me because I want to unpack the whole thing and be here till Sunday, but we're not going to do that. And so we're going to walk through each of these seven things that we're going to see John just unpack about who Jesus is over the next several months. And all these are incredible and he keeps coming back to him throughout this whole series. So here we go. Uh, John 1.1 says this, in the beginning, sounds like Genesis, right? It's the reason for that. He says, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So John starts this gospel account with Genesis language. And he says, in the beginning was the word. That's Jesus. And notice this about Jesus. He says, Jesus was both with God in the beginning, in the creation, and Jesus also was God. I always like when people are like, you know, the Bible never says that Jesus was God. You're like, okay, I don't know how you get much clearer than this one. Jesus was with God in the beginning, and Jesus was God. First thing that John makes incredibly clear is that Jesus is God. Jesus is the eternal God that when we open to Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning, Jesus is there. To understand the Bible, you have to understand the Bible teaches that God is a triune God. One God made up of three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit reigning for eternity. And here John starts his gospel in a world where there are people attacking Jesus and his divinity and his work, John starts right at kind of like Big E on the eye chart, right? Here's the main thing. If you get this wrong, you get the whole thing wrong. But if you get this right, this is the foundation to getting everything else right. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Jesus is God. God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit reigning for all eternity. First thing John makes clear, Jesus is God. Here's the second. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. 
Okay, second thing we have to see, not only is Jesus eternal God, Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the co-creator of the universe. That when we read in Genesis where God says, let there be light, let there be um, land and the expanse between the the land and the, the sky, who's there with God doing that? God the Father, God the Son is. Jesus is co-creator of the universe. You, you can never go back to a time where something was created that Jesus was not there. Jesus is not creation. Jesus is creator. He reigns with God for eternity, and he's God, and he's creator. Second member of the Trinity, he was there at creation. Jesus is the co-creator of the universe. This is really important, okay? In a couple weeks, as a church, we're going to go out and we, we say we're going to mug our neighbors, right? And you guys, if you paid attention to the announcements, you know, jokingly, they were like, let the mugging begin in a few weeks. And the hope is we're going to take a mug and we're going to put an invitation in it about Easter. You can put some candy in it or, you know, know your neighbor, know what they want. They want a little coffee in there, throw a little, not, not liquid coffee, like coffee beans, but just, you know, know your, know your neighbor, know your friend, know, this, is, this would be a gift for them, and then we're going to give you this mug, okay, in the hope you come to church and, and hear the good news of Jesus. And I, I'll tell you, it's amazing to me. We're starting to, because we've been at this now for three years, we're, we're just like now the mugging church. It's kind of fun. It's kind of our thing a little bit now. And what's pretty cool is people have been baptized over the last two years, and their story is, my friend gave me a mug, or my neighbor gave me a mug. And it's amazing how that simple step can change someone's entire life for the better, because you, you stepped out and, and did a, a risk, risk thing and invited someone to church. And this is where there are people who are like, you know, this is what I don't like about the Christian faith. Why do you have to go and invite someone? Right? Like maybe you have a friend and this, this is like the conversation with them. Like, why do you have to try to get me to come to church with you? Like, I feel spiritual, you know, and I don't need church and I don't need Jesus. I got, I kind of have this, I'm not religious. I'm just spiritual. And I got these little crystals and they kind of help me feel spiritual. And you hear that and you probably think, well, that's really stupid. But, you know, don't say that, okay? Uh, don't, unless you know your friend. Some of your friends are fine with that. You could actually tell. If it's a good friend and you guys have that type of relationship, you could just tell them, dude, come on, crystals, that's stupid. Um, but for the most part, most of them, you just kind of give it a little nod. Okay, okay. Um, but here's why. Here's why we have to invite. Here's why we have to share. Because we're not creator, we're creation, And my life will never make complete sense outside of me knowing why I've been created. I'll never know my gifts. I'll never know my purpose. My life will never truly be whole without being reconciled to my creator. And if I love you, if I I love you at all and want to help you, Part of the way I do that is by saying, you need to know why you're here. You need to know there's a God and he created you and he loves you. And your life will never truly be what it could be outside of knowing that creator. In fact, Paul picks this theme up in Colossians and he says it like this, um, that we are all things that are created, were created by Jesus. They've been created by him and for him. Meaning, your life is both created by Jesus and ultimately the purpose of your life, and this is where you'll never know your purpose without knowing this, is for his glory. You know, this is where people get so messed up, especially Americans, right? Because we think God exists for my glory. And we're like, God, why would you let me go through something hard? I thought you were here for my glory. But actually, our lives exist for his glory. And God has this amazing way. I got to share with this with the student ministry last night. Think of someone like Joseph who goes down a well and then goes into slavery and then goes into a prison and then gets forgotten about in prison. And I mean, it would have been so easy for Joseph to feel like God's forgotten me. 
but God was preparing Joseph and positioning Joseph for the right time where Joseph would come out and bring God glory. Jesus is the creator, and your life is a gift from him. And you're never truly going to enjoy your life or know your gifts or love others well unless you say, Jesus, here's my life. It's for you. That's why we share with others. We want them to know the joy of knowing their creator. So Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. Here's the third thing. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe that Jesus, did I skip a passage of scripture? I did, you know, whatever. We'll go back to it. It's, it's only the online sermon the whole country sees. They don't watch it anyway. Okay, here we go. Verse four. In him, that's not funny. In him was life and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness had not overcome it. This is amazing, right? In Jesus was light. The light shines into the darkness. And I love what it says. The darkness has not overcome it. So Jesus comes into this world as the light and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, some of your translations say it like this. The darkness has not understood it. And you read that and you're like, well, my translation says the darkness has not over understood it. My translation says the darkness has not overcome it. Which one is it? And the actual word is kind of both, right? So if you're like, well, is it overcome or understood? The answer is yes. Jesus comes. And the picture we get here is because of sin, our world is subject to darkness. Intellectual darkness, relational darkness, spiritual darkness. And I love this. Jesus comes in to this world. The light comes in, it breaks in, and the darkness can't stop it. See, the work of Jesus can't be intimidated out. It can't be bullied out. It can't be persecuted out. The light comes in. And even though people might not understand it, when the light comes in, truth is truth. Jesus comes to bring truth. I'd say it like this. Jesus reveals the path to life. You guys ever go to a movie in the summer? And you walk in in like the middle of the day. I'm young kids, a little, they're getting older. But when you go to the movies with your children during the day in the summer, it's so bright out, right? And then you walk into the theater and it's pitch dark. And you can't see anything. You're like, I can't see a thing. You look like Ben leading worship up here, you know, with sunglasses <laughs> on. And um, yeah, I was wrong. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but when you get there, what do they do in the movie theater? They put little lighted arrows on the alleys so you can see. And when Jesus comes in as the light, he comes in as the light to give direction, to give truth. And the truth of Jesus is true. So you know something's true because truth doesn't change based upon time or culture. If something's true, it's always true. Whether or not the darkness understands it or not. If something's true in New Jersey in 2024, it's just as true in Japan in 600 BC. And as you read the scriptures, this is what you see. Jesus gives truth, and it's always true. It's not like when God says, do not murder. Well, in New Jersey, two thousands of years after that, it's like, well, is murder really wrong? I mean, we do that because we're in the darkness. But it's just always true. God's truth transcends time. God's truth transcends culture. And the, the darkness can't, even though it can't sometimes understand the light, it can't stop it. It can't overcome it. God's truth will always be true. And Jesus is always revealing the path of life. Verse 6 says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. That all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Here's the fourth thing. 
Faithful followers of Jesus are witnesses for Jesus. This is talking about John the Baptist here, okay? It's not talking about John the author. I know that gets a little confusing in the prologue because like John's calling himself John in the third person. That's a little weird. He's not doing that. He's talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's ministry, he had, he had the job to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. He had the way to witness, and he called people to repentance. He called people to get ready. How do people get ready from John the Baptist that the kingdom of God's come in, in Jesus? The kingdom of heaven's broken into this world. It's not fully come come until Jesus' return, but it's broken in. And how does John prepare the way for that to get ready that the kingdom of heaven is broken in? He says, repent. Repent, get ready for the kingdom of heaven. And right away we see in the intro, we're gonna see this fleshed out in the most amazing ways in John's gospel. Faithful followers are Jesus' witnesses. And what's so awesome about John's gospel, it's so shocking to realize who the faithful followers become. Right? Because we expect what? The religious people are going to be really excited. Jesus shows up. I mean, they're the ones with the Old Testament. Many of them have it memorized. And you would think when Jesus shows up, they'd be like, there he is. But they're not. They kind of go out and persecute him, and yet at the same time, what's so beautiful is who ends up coming to Jesus. The least likely, the broken and the promiscuous and the drunks and the tax collectors and the sinners, they keep flocking to Jesus. And then what's awesome, he confronts their sin, the light shines in to the darkness, They repent, and then they go out as his witnesses. They tell the good news. To follow Jesus is to witness for Jesus. Jesus is like this. If you follow me, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Right? I'm going to follow Jesus is to fish for Jesus. Sometimes we make being a witness so complex. But all a witness does, if you, okay, you ready for this amazing definition? If you go to court and you're a witness, guess what you do? You witness what happened to you. You share what happened to you. You share what you saw. To be a Christian, to witness for Jesus, you just share what happened to you. And all over this room, there are just incredible stories. Some of you guys, you grew up and You were young and you had a grandma that loved Jesus and she shared the gospel with you and you became a Christian at five or six and you trusted Christ. And what's crazy, some of you guys are embarrassed to share that. That's a beautiful story. You're like, no, I want a cool story. I want to, I want to be like, you know, this crazy story that I was like shooting people and God grabbed my heart and I came to Christ. I'm like, no, no, no. Your grandma's story is awesome. Right? This is awesome. Praise God. Think of all he protected you from. That he allowed you to grow up and know the gospel. And you had a grandma that loved Jesus. She shared the gospel. Or you heard the gospel in a Sunday school. And then others of you guys, you were. You had the crazy story. And all you do when you're a witness, you share the story. And don't ever underestimate the power of you sharing your story. Man, Revelation 12 talks about Satan's persecution against the people of God for all time, right? The persecution at Christ's birth, the persecution against the church. It's just this like, (laughs) Revelation does this sometimes where it gives an image that's like a constant. It's like a theme that's ongoing. It's talking about the dragon's assault on the woman, the church, or at the birth. But it says what? In spite of the fiercest persecution, the people of God overcome. How? How? He says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That your story is powerful. You know how you overcome the enemy? The blood of the lamb, Christ's work for you, and the word of your testimony. And faithful followers of Jesus delight to share the story of what Christ has done in them. Here's the fifth one. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. 
He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is a theme we're going to see over and over and over in some amazing ways as we study John's gospel over the next eight months. It's the fifth thing. Many people will reject Jesus. Right? The light comes into the world. In fact, in John chapter 3, he says it like this. The light comes into the world, but the people loved the darkness rather than the light. They like love their sin or they love rebellion. We're just blind in the darkness. How many of you guys, this was your experience? You became a Christian and it felt like, oh my gosh, this is so clear. I, I, I can't believe I missed it all this time, but it's so clear. Jesus lived, he died, he rose. Like he promised, I'm going to die and rise. There's prophecies in the Bible that he's going to die and rise. And he's the only one to do that. So that takes away all the other possibilities. And then I confessed my sins and was reconciled to God. And this was your experience. It felt like scales came off my eyes and I could see. Right? My life was radically changed. A lot of you guys, you know that moment. Your life Change. You trusted Jesus, you crossed the line, and suddenly it's like the words of amazing grace made sense to you. I once was blind, but now I see. And you thought, this is so clear. And what you do? You said, I got to go tell the people I love. Why? Because when we follow Jesus, we witness for Jesus. And you did. You went to the people you loved. And you're like, I, I got to tell you this. I can't believe I missed it all the time. It's totally clear. Jesus is God. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. You should be a Christian. I've just become a Christian. And they're like, you're crazy. I'd be like, you're like, no, this, this is like, look at Isaiah. And they're like, I, I who? And they start like, well, what's gone into you? You think you're better than me now? No, 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 I don't, I don't think that at all. I'm a, I'm a sinner who's been saved by grace. I'm like a blind beggar who found bread, and I want you to find the bread, and this is not because I'm awesome, it's because Jesus is awesome. I just want you to see it. And you thought, I can see, like, people want to see. It makes sense. They're going to they're gonna just jump at the all. All I need to do is share it, and you go and share it, and what happens? They're like, you're nuts, or... You think you're better than us. Or uh, my friends in high school, when I really embraced my faith at 19, I was like, I got to tell my friends they're idiots. And they still are because they didn't listen. Okay. And um, I went and I told them and I thought, are you ready? And they're like, they started calling me Reverend Ryan. <laughs> like that's what they're like. Oh, Reverend Ryan's here. Reverend Ryan's here. Going to preach the gospel at us. I'm like, I am going to preach the gospel at you guys. But it was super discouraging because it was so plain. Like I could see it. And they wanted nothing to do with it. Why? Because the light shines in the darkness, but many people reject the light. Sometimes they reject it for the same intellectual stuff we see in the book of Genesis. Where God goes, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? You don't get to define your own good and evil. God defines what's good. God defines what's evil. But we go, man, that was a long time ago. I think I know better than God. So I want to call this thing good that God calls evil. And I want to call what God calls good, I want to call that evil. Sometimes it's intellectual. Sometimes it's just what John says. Men love the darkness rather than the light. Sometimes it's just, I just want to sin. Like, I just, I, I'd rather get drunk. I'd rather get high. I'd rather sleep with whoever. I'd rather, you know, just not change. Or I feel like, that's nice. You have a Savior. I don't need all that. I don't need a crutch. Just pride. Just love the darkness rather than the light. One of the things we're going to see over the next several months is just how many times Jesus ministers so well to people and people remain in the darkness. How many times people are shown that they're wrong and they remain in the darkness? How many people live their lives in ways in rebellion against God and it doesn't work? 
And yet, they'll still hit their head against the wall, hit their head against the wall, rather than bend their knee to Jesus. Why? Because their hearts are hard and they love the darkness rather than the light. The Puritans would say it like this, the same sun that can melt the ice can harden the clay. The same light that softens some people's hearts hardens other people's hearts. And one of the most heartbreaking things in the world is to see people reject Jesus and just watch their lives get worse and worse and worse. And they still refuse to surrender to him. And in John's gospel, over and over we see it. Many reject Jesus. Here's some awesome news. The sixth thing. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. While many reject Jesus, here's an awesome thing. Some receive him. This is the most important thing you could ever realize. Every human being, when it comes to Jesus, is either going to receive him or reject him. Notice, there's no third category for John. He's like, some have received Jesus, some have rejected, some are just kind of straddling the fence. That doesn't exist. Either you've received Jesus or what? You've rejected him. If I offer you a gift and I say, here's a gift, Jesus offers his life as a gift to you, and you don't take the gift, what have you done? You've rejected it. If Jesus says, look at the evidence, I was going to come and live and die and rise, and he did all that. He says, I've given you the evidence, I've given you the truth, the truth is true, the tomb is empty, Jesus rose. To not respond to that truth is to reject that truth. And yet, here's the really good news. Some people receive Jesus. The most important decision you could ever make in your whole life is to move from being someone who spends their time rejecting Jesus to actually go and receive Jesus. And I love how it says it. How does he say in John that they do that? They says, to all who did receive him, who what? Who believed in his name. Now, when the Bible says to believe in someone's name, it doesn't just mean you believe his name's Jesus. It's not like we get to heaven, he's like, what's the password? <laughs> Jesus. No. Um, to, like, and this is important because sometimes people are like, there's power in the name of Jesus. And there is, but it's not saying that we just go, Jesus, and there's power in that. Uh, what, when the Bible says in his name, power in his name, or believe in his name, to, to believe on someone's name is their essence, their person, their life, their work. To believe in Jesus' name is to believe in his life and his ministry, his death and his resurrection. That there's power in his name means there's power in his name because the essence of who he is, what he's come and what he taught and what, how he lived and the fact that he died and rose, that's what it means when it says there's power in his name or to believe in his name. And he goes, you know how you receive him? You believe in his name. You believe that Jesus came and died and rose as he said. You put your faith there. And that was so amazing. When you believe in his name, he says, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That when you receive Jesus, you believe in his name, and God the Father adopts you into his family. He makes you a son. He makes you his daughter. Sometimes people say, we're all God's children. We are all God's creation. But the Bible says, only through the work of Jesus are we adopted into his family as his sons and daughters. By believing in his name, we be, have the right to be reconciled, to become children of God. And John says, not born of natural descent or a husband's will, but of God. That you are supernaturally born by the work of God through belief in his name and receiving his work for you. And I'm just telling you, for some of you, the most important thing you can wrestle with is, have I received or rejected Jesus? Because that's just clear. To receive him by believing his name, you have the right to become children of God. And here's the last one. 
It's awesome. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Again, that's John the Baptist. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Amazing section of scripture. And there's so much there. But he says, the word became flesh. The co-creator God put on human flesh. He did not take his divinity off and put flesh on. He was fully God, and he put on human flesh and became fully man. And the seventh thing we see is that Jesus makes God the Father visible. He is the full revelation of God the Father's character, of who he is, of his love, and his heart. I love how he says in John, he goes, the law came from Moses. And the law came, Moses gave us the law through God, right? He taught us the law. Grace and truth come through Jesus. I mean, the law had a purpose, but it wasn't fulfilled until Jesus. So, for example, um, years ago, it was probably like 2015, I think. I remember the day with Cinco de Mayo. I took off work. It was a Monday. And I called Steve, and I said, hey, Steve, I've got to do some yard work. I'm just going to, I'm totally behind. It's May. My yard is a disaster. I'm just going to take a vacation day and do yard work. The night before, my neighbor was like, hey, your yard's a disaster. Um, <laughs> let me help you. And so I was like, really? He's like, yeah, because we cut a few trees down. There's branches all over. He said, let's just burn the, br the branches, and, you know, uh, we'll start early and and uh, we'll just burn them up and it should take half a day. It was illegal, all right? Um, and, and so we start working. And it's like 8 a.m. So like 8 a.m. We're, we're burning these branches. And it's windy. And I'm like to my neighbor, I'm like, does it, like, does it matter that it's so windy? But just, just so you guys know, I'm not a really handy guy. Like, <laughs> I think you might already be figuring this out, but I'm just not. I'll confess that to you. Things are broken around my house that is, I just probably are just as simple as like, and it would work, but this is where we're at. Okay, so anyway, he's like, so I'll just help you. And so we put, we're starting to burn the stuff and it's getting pretty windy. And all of a sudden like wind gust and it blows onto my lawn. And now my yard catches on fire. And so... So at this house was like a giant cliff to our backyard. It, it was a kind of kind of big drop down. It was a row of boulders, and um, then it was like a flat tier. And so the yard has a fire on it, and I'm like fire. And my neighbor, my neighbor's like old. You know, like old guys know everything. <laughs> So this is like, he, I guess I'm old, but I don't know everything. So anyway, so he's just like totally cool and collected. And literally, every time the wind blows, my yard was like a giant cigarette. It looks like it was taking a giant drag. And like the circle fire was just getting bigger. And he's just walking in the middle of it with like cardboard, patting it out. So I like run up. And I get the hose, I climb the hill, and I'm trying to spray my backyard with, uh, with the hose. And so I run, it's like not a long hose, because I'm not handy, and uh, I'm spraying it like this, because I'm trying to reach the fire, but I can't. I'm just wetting the row of boulders in the hill, and finally I get this five-gallon bucket, and I'm filling it up, and at this point, no joke, the fire alarm's going off in town. It did. The fire department came, and the police, and... We got it out before they got there. They still yelled at me, though. Um, and so, uh, so he, he got it out, technically, by walking on it. But um, So I'm spraying, and I got the five-gallon bucket, and I jump off the hill with a five-gallon bucket, and I land on the boulders I just soaked. And, you know, rocks are slippery when they're wet. And so I jumped, no joke, like 15 feet down, landed on rocks, and my feet went like, Pff, and they just kicked out. Do you ever have the moment where you're about to enter a serious pain and you suddenly are in the matrix? <laughs> Everything goes slow. And so I'm horizontal, a row of boulders under me, 
from like a 15 foot jump. And this is my thought. I'm about to break my back. <laughs> like as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I, I wonder if I'll ever walk again as I'm in the air. Like this is the conversation I'm having with myself. And, and I fall a little bit like this and I land on my elbow. And um, the fire goes out. I'm just kind of crumpled there, like sitting there thinking, I bet I'm pretty injured. And um, the police come down and they like, they're like, yeah, you're good. And I said, I don't know what the fire guys are going to do because sometimes they get a little crazy, but they laughed. And the fire guy came down, one, one poor kid. We had the fire out, but they made him come down with like the little thing and go around. I'm just sitting there. No one asked, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, I'm just like right there. And uh, finally they leave and my neighbor looks at me and I'm like, so... Uh, I want to keep going? And he's like, I have a hunch you're pretty hurt. And I said, no, man, I think I'm okay. And he's like, no, you, I think you're, you, you're pretty messed up. And uh, I said, I feel okay. And he said, how about this? You go in your house, a couple minutes, see how you feel. And if, you, if you're injured, I'll just drive you to the hospital. So I get my house and I sit down and I put on Sports Center. It's, it's like 8.45. I have not even made it to 9 a.m., okay? <laughs> like, this is how... And I, my elbow suddenly is very large. And I'm like, all right, let's just see how this goes. And I just kind of go like this. And it was fine. I'm like, look at that. And then I went like this. And it felt like I had a cavity in my elbow that got shot with a bullet <laughs> and then lit on fire. So it hurts so bad. And I was like, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go get my neighbor. I'm just gonna drive myself to the ER. So I drove myself to the ER and they yelled at me because they're like, you can't do that. <laughs> You're going to shock. I'm like, I made it. And, um, <laughs> and then they x-rayed me and the guy came in and he said, your elbow is shattered. Okay, yeah. Whatever. It didn't hurt, which was weird. It, didn't, it really didn't hurt that bad. You think shattered elbow, and he's like, yeah, muscles and stuff hurt way more than bones. Um, here's the thing. In some ways, it's a very long illustration to make one very simple point. <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, the law of Moses is like that x-ray. It can say, this is broken, this is wrong. But it couldn't fix it. What I needed was the surgeon that night to cut me open and put a bunch of hardware in here and piece it back together in some ways to get right down in there and heal it up. And in, in some ways, that's what Jesus does. The law could diagnose it, but Jesus had to incarnate himself to come down full of grace and truth to heal us. And Man, I'll just, just end with this in the final minute. The thing our world does not get about God is that he's full of grace and truth. And those two things don't compete. He's full of truth. He calls sin, sin. He's holy. He defines what's right and wrong. And so, some of you guys, you get that God, right? But also, he's full of grace and abounding in love. Sometimes people are like, man, God the Father, I just don't get. I like Jesus. You know how God the Father revealed himself fully? Through Jesus. You want to understand God the Father? Look at Jesus. Full of grace and truth. He came in to heal us. He's got to tell you the truth. He's got to give you the diagnosis. Your sin separated you from God. But Jesus also provided the surgery. He went to the cross. He died in our place so that our sins can be forgiven. Have you received him? Have you received grace upon grace upon grace in Jesus? And my prayer is that you have. You've grabbed hold of it. Let, let me pray for us that, that we would. God, we're thankful for Jesus, for his life, for his ministry, and that Jesus makes God the Father visible. Uh, Jesus makes God the Father's heart and his love and his truth 
um, seen. Thank you that Jesus put on human flesh and that he lived the life we couldn't live. That he didn't just point to what was broken in us, but he came right down among us. He became a human so that he could do the healing work we couldn't do. He could take our sin upon himself. He could die on a cross and rise from death. And God, I, I pray that tonight there are some who they've never truly received your work for them. And tonight would be a night where they just bow their knee to you. They surrender to you that you are God. You are full of truth and you are holy and yet, amazingly, you're full of grace and you delight to reconcile people to yourself. God, let us not be like the hard-hearted people in John that are full of pride. But let us come to you in humility, like the people who totally shock the world that they're the ones who follow Jesus, who delight in your grace. And God, I pray that we would walk well with you. I pray for those who know you that they'd walk well with you for your glory and delight that you've brought them grace and truth and they wouldn't minimize either side of that. We ask all of that for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and continue to worship together. Without hope, without light
John will unpack for us over the next several months as we get to see Jesus minister and raise up the disciples and teach and uh, ultimately do miraculous things and, and, and shock us in that who he chooses to, to, to walk with him and the people who reject him and the people who receive him. God, thank you for your incredible mystery displayed of your ultimate love through your son. God, would it fill us with great joy as we walk out of here. God, help us to be witnesses as your creation to help others know that they'll never truly find the, the purpose or the thing they're longing for without knowing their creator. Give us love and wisdom and tact as we do that. Humility and kindness, but also truth, grace and truth. We ask that for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you'd like prayer for anything in your life, there's a prayer team over against that wall. They'd love to pray for you and hope you guys have a great night.